So Danny is a repeat offender, <laughs> speaking almost every Suricon, I think, maybe. Every other one. Every other one, okay. So. <laughs> uh, Danny is at uh, ProtectWise, which is, uh, recently was acquired by Verizon. Uh, has been contributing to the Suricata project uh, and uh, is, is going to talk about something that interests me a great deal. Uh, as I said in my talk uh, uh, before uh, uh, yesterday, is um, about his thoughts about a library version of Suricata. So uh, please welcome Danny Browning. <laughs> yeah, I was hoping it would mirror for me, but it doesn't seem to want to. Okay, I can see that one. Oh, there we go. Let's see if this works. All right. Yeah, so as Victor mentioned, this is kind of my attempt at doing Suricata as a library. It's, um, we'll get into that more, but to start out with, and kind of to wake everybody up, how many of you interact with Suricata by only using the application against network traffic and looking at the logs? Show of hands, anyone? Couple? Um, <clears throat> how many of you use Suricata to generate information that is then forward that forwarded to another kind of analysis engine? A few more of you. And finally, how many of you feed Suricata with traffic captured from another source? Right. Um, so out of all of you, how many of you have felt limited by Suricata input and output capabilities. Got a couple people. Um, so, just a little history lesson. Uh, Bellini started in like the 1920s. Uh, it's a cocktail of, of peach puree and prosecco, um, named after an uh, artist, Giovanni Bellini. Supposedly, it matches up with the color of a saint's robe in one of the pictures. I was trying to find it. That was about the closest one I could find. If anyone knows the picture, I would love to be able to see it. But the idea behind it is you take a pure spirit, you add some fresh ingredients, and you, quit, and you create a new drink. Um, in this case, it's quite yummy. Uh, don't let Ray tell you otherwise. <laughs> Suricata as a library has been a feature requested 2016, maybe even earlier. <laughs> uh, there is actually an issue that came out of the roadmap discussion last year, so if you want to look into that. Uh, there's not a whole lot of information in the ticket, so if you have specific specifics around what a library should look like, how Suricata should function as a library, please feel free to comment on that ticket. But starting from that as... Um, kind of a basic idea, we then move into what does it mean to be a library? And the kind of raw definition of that is a suite of data and programming code that is used to develop software programs and applications. It, de it is designed to assist both the programmer and the programming language compiler in building and executing software. Okay, so we have an application and we have Suricata as a library. Not a whole lot of help there. So that means between the ticket, using some more description, basic discussions, I'm just gonna kinda take a stab at what that means. First of all, we would like to be able to configure it programmatically. Um, I'm sure most of you are familiar with the Suricata YAML and all the configuration that is available in there. And as Shivani mentioned, breaking out Vim to make edits to it, it'd be kind of nice to just be able to kind of do a couple things in code here and there. 
Uh, we also want to be able to control Suricata programmatically. So we should be able to spin it up, have it run, have it uh, bring in packets, have it get alerts out to us. Um, there's also a number of great kind of runtime features that are available between rule reloading or using the Unix socket for memory caps. Um, so that also brings me to this. <laughs> Isn't this just the Unix socket? Um, one of the first things is, is that it doesn't really provide complete control over Suricata. Um, it's also a little bit kind of racy because it kind of sits outside of Suricata. And if you're trying to feed it packets, uh, this usually ends up involving writing some files to disk and then having Suricata pick them up. So, um, at ProtectWise, which is now Verizon, we try to develop software in a very agile fashion. Uh, this is little a agile, not big agile that most people really don't like. Uh, so we kind of want to think of what would it look like to produce a minimal viable product, and in this case, even before that, what's kind of the work that we could do to really see if this is useful for users in the community. How we would not do this, and I'm sure a lot of you have very um, a large number of stories or are very experienced with this is the whole idea of completely refactor, rewrite, re-architect, um, where we would be able to eject thread management, combine all the sources, expose memory management, everything there. As we've talked about in previous Suricons and Victor was mentioning, this is a lot of work. And it's a lot of work for something that has been requested, but we don't necessarily know if it's really valuable or even how people would really use it and interact with it. So let's try to figure out what we can do to easily prove value, get feedback, and figure out what we really want to do to Suricata to kind of expose this as a feature. So as I mentioned in the beginning, we want some easy control and configuration of Suricata. We want easy ingestion of alerts and events, and we want easy sharing of packet data. This is where the idea of Bellini comes in. We're gonna take some features, mix it into an existing product. Hopefully it turns out new and tasty, and people like it, and they wanna use it, and we're able to keep moving forward with it. So, why would I wanna do this? <laughs> um, some of my contributions to Sericata are support around reading PCAP files, um, both in terms of just a directory kind of mode and also kind of a continuous keep alive mode where you keep throwing files into a directory, it keeps processing them. Turned out it was somewhat useful for testing. It's also useful for Unix socket as kind of a continuous feed mode. Um, and I did this because I've been attempting to use Suricata as a library since 2014. And if you've talked to me, you know that I have an application that combines Scala, JNI, the JVM, and Suricata. And if you've dealt with all of those technologies at once, it's pretty painful. <laughs> so I'm looking to kind of get more performance out of this and most importantly, more reliability out. So that brings us to how would we build this thing? First and foremost, OIS will own it. I hope, maybe one day, we'll see. <laughs> I can dream. So I'm kind of looking at languages that are already kind of the, under the OISF umbrella. So that means right now, Kotlin, Go, C Sharp, whatever your favorite language is, is kind of immediately nixed. The main ones currently being used are Python, C and C++, and Rust. We're building a library, so that kind of eliminates Python. Yes, we could possibly build a library, but there's a bunch of overhead that would come with that as we pull it into other projects. 
there's also just the state of the ecosystem in Python. Um, between Python 2 and 3s, it's supposed to move to 3. Some people are vehemently opposed to that. C and C++ are another possibility. However, like Victor mentioned, we want something is, that is going to be secure. If we take the C and C++ approach, we're going to have to add in a lot of tooling. And there's been a lot of work on that front. We're seeing more fuzzing. But just beyond that, linting, uh, lots of reviews to make sure that whatever we're building is maintainable, readable, secure, performant. Um, and for non-opinionated languages, it's much harder because there's a lot of wide vari variations in how something is going to be implemented. And then that leaves us with Rust. Um, in case you haven't heard about Rust yet, it is a very safe performant language. And it's safe without a lot of tooling. It's just baked in the language. So although we can add fuzzing and additional tools to find possible bugs, we're likely going to find less. It also incorporates almost as easily as C and C++. Um, there's a lot of tools out there that make it really easy to stand up your Rust library and pull it into other languages. There's also the fact that I'm kind of biased. I'm a Rust fan. If you find me on LinkedIn, I actually have my title as Chief Rust and Instigator. So <laughs> um, I really enjoy the language. So that made it at least easy for me. Hopefully, <laughs> it's not a bad decision. Back to kind of Agile. We want to figure out what we kind of have to work on first. Uh, there's kind of the three areas. The first is process control. Rust actually has a very good ecosystem now. Um, and so process control, it has both great synchronous process control. It's actually baked into the standard library. It also has asynchronous process control as well. Uh, there's a library out there called Tokyo that will allow you to spawn up your processes, get input and output, or provide input and get output asynchronously. Um, as I mentioned before, Suricata has some great runtime features like reloading rules with Unix singles. That's baked into Tokyo as well. So that one's not too much of a risk. It should be fairly easy to kind of take on and build. Uh, receiving alerts, uh, kind of the primary way to receive alerts now is with the um, Eve JSON format and possibly via Unix sockets. Same thing, Tokyo has great support for Unix domain sockets, so we can just kind of plug that in and we're getting stuff out of there. Rust also has an amazing library called Serde, which supports serialization and deserialization of a ton of formats uh, in a strongly typed manner. And it even supports JSON with that. So receiving alerts doesn't look too bad. And then finally, we have getting packets to Suricata. Rust has packet capture libraries, so we can possibly get them that way. Suricata has a whole bunch of sources where we have file and different interface cards. But overall, there's not really a good solution there for getting packets between Suricata and our library that we're building. So sending packets is kind of the biggest risk to building this whole thing. Um, there has been some kind of previous work in doing this. Um, um, sorry. There's always interface replay, where you set up an interface as kind of a dummy, you capture from it. Uh, but one of the things we kind of run into is that you can't maintain your timestamps when you're doing that. And if you're kind of trying to tie a number of systems together, you want to make sure that your packets and their timestamps are consistent across all those. Uh, there's also DPDK. Uh, at one point, there was even a pull request to kind of make a DPDK source in Suricata. Uh, it's also a bit heavier lift than I was looking for in this project you kind of have to buy into DPDK fully. And 
at least as far as interfaces go, there's also additional requirements around servers. So I wanted something that was a little bit lighter weight because as I mentioned, we're just trying to stand something up, get some value, see how people are using it and where they're gonna take this. Um, if you follow the Rust project, you realize that it came out of Mozilla and they're trying to, and they were trying to make something that allows them to build browsers a lot safer and faster. Um, and so they have this project called Servo. Uh, it's a high performance parallel browser engine. And as part of this, they have essentially different kind of windows, context, engines that they're rendering things between. And they needed a way to kind of pass information between these separate processes so that they're isolated and sandboxed and they're not bleeding into each other. They created this library called uh, IPC channel. Uh, if you're familiar with Go, you've kind of hired the idea of Go routines and Go channels. Rust has something similar where you can push a message on one side, somebody can listen on the other end. They're not um, sharing like a global mutable state which causes all sorts of problems. So we have IPC channel and really the only requirement around it is that it can handle serialization and deserialization from survey. So this was kind of a promising approach for getting things between processes. It's already built, it's already built to be high performant. It's maintained by Mozilla, so we don't really have to worry about maintainers going away. So first things first, add a source to Suricata. Um, it's actually not too bad. So if you are looking to do this, feel free to reach out. Um, actually, it was a lot faster than I thought it was gonna be. There's a couple little gotchas. You need a receive thread, a decode thread, and at least for this one, we have to configure how we're gonna find our IPC source. Uh, slight little caveat to this is that most of the sources are built to be kind of a live capture mode. Um, packets from a file are a little bit different, but this was even slightly different from that because we're constantly feeding stuff, we're keeping it alive, the packets are coming in a certain way, so that was really the only gotcha that I ran into that I kind of needed a new run mode since this was a mix, a hybrid mode of the ones that had previously existed. Um, so that was actually fairly fast, but this is where it started getting a little harder. Our external system has some information about the packets. We know the bytes, we know the links, we know the timestamps. It has also allocated the packet data. Uh, Suricata kind of, in the existing packet sources, is the owner of those packets. So it takes control of them, it deletes them. Here we're kind of interacting together, so we have to figure out how we're gonna make those two systems play nicely together. So this is where essentially a packet IPC interprocess communication library comes in. We're gonna represent a packet, we're gonna pass it to servo IPC uh, using Serdate and one of the serialization formats is bin code. We're gonna process it in Suricata. All right, I have no idea how we're gonna process it in Suricata. <laughs> so let's figure that out. Rust has some dark arts. Um, this is what makes it able to be a library, makes it able to pull in C code, makes it have a large ecosystem. There's actually a whole book around it called the Nomicon. If you wanna learn how to do very unsafe stuff with Rust, that's where you have to go. This is where the black magic of Rust with unsafe and FFI comes in. And it's kind of funny because the project's goal is to design and implement a safe, concurrent practical systems language. There's some ways to do some unsafe stuff. And in this case, we need to control when the packets are cleaned up. And that's, we also need FFI because we're dealing with C code. I will say that just because it's unsafe doesn't mean you've completely turned off all of the features of Rust. 
it still does a lot of the compiler things. It's more a superset of the language than completely disabling all the safety that was built in. But anytime you're dealing with C or FFI, you will have to reach into this area. So now we get to kind of take those two things and try to smush them together. And luckily, and a big thank you to Pierre, Suricata supports Rust. This made my life a lot easier and <clears throat> is one of the things that kind of enabled me to do this. However, it was quickly apparent that it is painful to kind of add new features to Rust, so one of the first things I did was take our existing kind of Rust C header generation and convert it to C bind gen. There's actually a pull request out there that'll hopefully get merged very soon. Um, and so now additional Rust code, including parsers, if you end up writing a parser, just kind of automatically adds to the header. You don't have to do a whole bunch of additional work. All you really have to do is mark things with either a C representation or extern. It will get picked up by bind gen and be usable from the C code. In this case, we have a couple functions, like creating and releasing our IPC client, or populating packets in Suricata using that client that we've created. And for those of you that aren't developers, sorry for the code. <laughs> and since it's a interop code, it's also even more uh, ugly to look at than normal code. <laughs> so great, we've kind of munged them together. We're off, we have a library that is really slow. <laughs> uh, so let's see, Surday is a framework for serializing and deserializing Rust data structures efficiently and generically, except when it's making multiple copies of everything. So do you have to kind of look and see what your libraries are doing? We're seeing a couple extra allocations due to bin code, but Rust is very powerful. Um, most of you in dealing with Rust will probably never have to get into this, uh, but you can do a lot of great things once you get used to using lifetimes and zero copy capabilities in Rust, and that's what I had to reach for here. So on the left hand side, there's kind of like an IPC packet that we can kind of skip some copies with and then Coming out on the other side, there's Rust concepts around borrowing things, and that's where you see the wonderful kind of tick A or tick DE syntax. Those are Rust lifetimes. Uh, yeah, they're very useful. They can cause a whole bunch of headaches when you're not used to them, and that's kind of where libraries come in they will hide most of this from you so you don't have to deal with it. But in this case, I wasn't one of those lucky ones. I had to reach and grab tools deep in the toolbox for this one. And this is also where we get all that unsafe stuff. And don't try this at home. <laughs> uh, but there are a number of ways to kind of pull things together, not have Rust clean it up until we want it to, have ownership of the packets in Rust, not have kind of memory cleanup issues. And so you see uh, one of those nice, fun, unsafe blocks. Uh, Rust still works in there, we're still getting our stuff cleaned up, but we now have kind of that super set of power and we're able to actually make this work, make it usable. And at this point, we're over one gigabit for this library, so that's kind of a good point where it should satisfy a lot of use cases and be valuable for most people to use. Back to what we were talking about in the beginning, process spawning, process spawning, spawning monitoring and output, Tokyo process, Unix domain sockets, Tokyo UDS, alert processing, survey JSON. We already have those libraries, we pull them in write a little code around them. If you're not familiar with Surday, um, it makes it super easy to do strongly typed serialization and deserialization of messages. So on the right hand side is kind of like what 
uh, Eve message coming out of Sericata looks like. Just uh, fields with specific types, only kind of um, thing we had to worry about is that the, the timestamp, sometimes they're parsable, sometimes they're not. Survey makes it so you can easily add custom parsers for fields if you need to. So pulling all the E messages out of Sericata was actually quite fast. And that brings us to this guy. So hopefully this looks good. Uh, there's a few examples that are in the Bellini source code. Uh, one of those is what if you kind of want to do your own custom rule? One of the features that is built in there is this idea of an Intel cache. So you can have a rule and you can have associated metadata. It's going to spit out the rule to disk so that Suricata can use it when it's running. It's also going to have a cache of the metadata. This is a really simple one. Uh, there's a key, there's a rule, and Metadata in this case is just a URL. And so kind of the same thing. See some survey code up here. Here's our rule, key, metadata. And then come here. Here is actually kind of an entire Bellini source code example. Hopefully, since it's Rust, we can kind of create a user interface that is fairly e easy to use. N maybe not as easy as if we were doing this in Python and YAML, but hopefully it's easy enough to pick up for anyone kind of coming into Rust. You don't really have to get too far into the language. It should mostly just be easy to read and use. Start out with, we can actually read our rules, stick them in our Intel cache, and have the cache materialize the rules to disk for us so we can use them. And then we spin up a new, essentially, IDS here, which is Suricata. So it will start up and run. We can get our alerts from that. And then it also spits out all the output that we want. We're going to spawn that off in another thread. We're also going to spawn something off that is sending packets to our IDS. And then for all the alerts that are coming in, we can receive it and then grab some information out of it. And in this case, look it up in our cache, spit out the rule, and spit out the message that came back. Uh, can everyone see that? Good. So, there we go. We now have Bellini starting up Suricata. You can see some of the initial, some of the output that's coming out of it. We receive an alert from it. In this case, we have our rule that we matched on here. There's our metadata that we added to it. And here was the actual alert that fired, all the info there. So fairly straightforward to do custom rules. And then another one. We want to add a new output source. Rather than completely changing Suricata to add this new output source, Let's just use some Rust libraries and produce the Kafka. Stand up a Kafka producer. Most of the things here look very similar. If you're using just straight IDS rules, um, Bellini actually can parse just straight IDS rules, pull out the JIT and SID, put it into Intel cache and allow you to get it out of it. Kind of the same thing. IDS, alerts. We're going to grab each alert and then we're going to put it onto Kafka. Let's see here. Spin up my Kafka consumer. Hopefully demo god shine on me and nothing died while I was walking up here. <laughs> and then let's run this guy. So there we go. Same thing. Stuff fired. We produced a Kafka. Our Kafka consumer saw it. So now we've been able to kind of prove out a new output, been able to prove out metadata all with a few lines of code to see if it's actually worthwhile. We can either keep it outside of Suricata as our own functionality, or if we decide we need more stuff out of the Suricata, we can now kind of get some feedback, push it into Suricata. Right. 
Uh, initial features, as you saw, monitor Suricata process and output. Uh, we can receive alerts from Suricata. Uh, we can tie that alerts to custom intel. So you define however your rules look like, what intel they want with it. You can send those packets to Suricata. Uh, there's even a concept of a tracer where you can send through a tracer packet and get it back out so you can record timing information and make sure, your, make sure Suricata is running okay. Uh, saw some of the examples. There's one that's just processing from a file and logging it out. You saw custom intel and sending alerts to Kafka. Which comes up to the now what? Um, yesterday's talk on a JSON schema definition, uh, that would be amazing. If I had a JSON schema, then I could just kind of uh, cogen all the possible messages. Another possibility is we kind of bake that into Suricata so that multiple people can use it. Right now I have it running on just one capture thread. So splitting up the packets, sending them to essentially multiple IPC or either multiple IPCs or splitting them up in Suricata. There's a couple ways to do it. Also releasing it, bad part about working for a large multinational corporation is things move very slowly. So hopefully it will be released here shortly. Um, it does depend on kind of this IPC source. So there's a pull request that I have to get in and get that approved. Beyond that, looking one for people to try it out and see if it's useful for them. And if it is, some of the features that they're looking for, uh, such as maybe better supervision, seeing how your Suricata is running, performing, handle restarts, possibly alert you when things are going poorly, handle some of the errors when it starts up. Uh, runtime configuration. Uh, you can change a number of settings at runtime, maybe add support for the Unix socket to control all this runtime configuration. Also possible just to send it through as a message somehow with IPC. There's a couple ways. Another one is auto configuration. So just kind of say like give me a config for this throughput or give me a config for this type of traffic and it can just spit out a Suricata config for you. Additional outputs, um, everything's moving to the cloud today so maybe you want a fire hose output. We could add that pretty quickly and so you could have all your alerts be going to fire hose in AWS. Uh, maybe some minimal capture in there to help with kind of doing performance testing of rules or QA at a, um, because if you're using T-Rex, uh, you're usually capturing from a set of interfaces. And then beyond that, suggestions. Let me know what you'd like to see and you just kind of want to see really quickly before you have to think about if it is good to add to the main Suricata code base. And then lastly, questions. Hi, uh, could you please let us know what is the uh, footprint of the library which you have right now? The footprint of like the library? Uh -huh. It's going to be slightly bigger than whatever footprint you configure for Suricata. So Rust uses up very small stuff. So we're talking like m most of the time it's 100 megabytes or less and could probably get that even smaller. Uh, most of it is very kind of transient in memory stuff that ends up in Suricata. So your Suricata instance is going to be your primary driver of memory footprint where that is based on your configuration settings and the size of your rules. This library itself is not a lot of overhead. And the one uh, GBPS speed which was achieved Yep. Uh, could you share uh, the details as, as to on which CPU it was run on? Uh, I believe when we were testing, kind of, we were actually using this to capture from an interface with T-Rex, and I believe it was on 
either a four or eight core CPU, but um, the library is multi-threaded, so it's going to hit each of the cores probably like two to three percent, and then same thing, Suricata is going to hit the CPU based on how you have Suricata configured. So even though it kind of has one capture thread, you can still have fan out and multiple management threads, and then the overhead of actually doing the detections. The library is a very thin facade over Suricata to kind of enable this feature set. Okay. Thank you. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. I think I'm, I might have missed it. Are you forking Suricata somewhere in the background or running it as a, as a demon? It's being forked. <laughs> yep. <laughs> uh, so, so the setup reminds me a bit of um, uh, the Clem AV demon. Would, would that sort of that comparison makes sense to you? Yep. Uh, it was influenced um, how Clam runs, how uh, Silence runs. There's a number of them that kind of work in that fashion where you kind of fork or spawn or have a daemon running in the background and then you kind of provide just a small API to be able to interact with it. And that seemed to be the fastest approach to kind of get this functionality in front of users so that we could see is it useful and do we really need to go down the road of actually doing all that work in Suricata or is this enough to handle the use cases that people are looking for? Yeah, right. So, so I once did a sort of very quick and dirty proof of concept that's a bit similar. It used Redis to ship the packets. It was far too slow. Uh, but the idea was that I patched a uh, curl uh, to get access to the unencrypted data, ship it to Suricata, do something. Yep. Um, but then, of course, if, if you would do such an approach, Suricata has a pretty big startup time if you use a, a, a big rule set. Could yep. be minutes, uh, in, depending on your setup. So to integrate that into command line tools that from which you expect uh, sort of instant responses, it's, it's uh, not very, very feasible. So I was thinking about the Clem, Clem D approach at the time. It seems like this would, would also uh, fit that a bit. Uh, although it's not really a full, full demon mode yet, but that yeah. would be possible, I think. So we could possibly do something like this. In this case, um, at least with Servo IPC, we kind of have to stand up a server that Suricata is then going to connect into. If we wanted to, we could do kind of a dual mode where you either run it with Suricata connecting or you flip it and Suricata stands up the server and then we connect to that. Um, just kind of have to have some way to find who is going to be the server and what the name of that connection is. But yeah, if we wanted to leave it as kind of the clam demon approach, it wouldn't be a whole lot of work. It's just a little inversion of who owns the channel type thing. I went with the library owning the channel just for a little bit more observability in terms of what config is being run and how I'm running it. So, yeah. but yeah, the Suricata startup time is kind of a limiting factor if you're trying to do it more like a command line approach. Very interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Any other questions? <laughs>